podcast contains descriptions of death and violence that some listeners may find upsetting. Hello and welcome to the Six O'Clock Knock, the true crime podcast that takes a fresh look at murder. I'm Jack Morell. I served as a police officer from 1985 to 2015. My last 12 years in the job were spent exclusively dealing with homicides as a detective sergeant. And I'm Simon Ford, a journalist and writer. I have years of experience in radio and broadcasting. I still have a nose for a good story. And Jack is still keen to apply his copper's brain to cases, whether solved or not. That's right, and this episode will focus on murder on the railway. Of course, we touched on the railways a few episodes back, didn't we? The Frederick Deeming case, serial swindler and bigamist with a penchant for murdering his wives. Yes, indeed. He used the opportunity to travel that steam trains and steamships gave 19th century society. He travelled extensively, and he used a different name in every town. The Victorian era meant that travel was so much easier and quicker. The railways had revolutionised transport, replacing those horse-drawn stagecoaches that up to then were the quickest way to get from one town to another. Right. Mass travel had arrived. Passengers were less conspicuous, travelling in greater numbers. The commute had arrived, and with it, the travelling criminal. Yeah, we're looking at this subject after someone suggested a particular case known as the murder on the Brighton Line. But when we started digging, we found two others on the same stretch of railway line between London and Brighton. Well, as your fellow journalist, the late Sir Harry Evans said, keep digging, the truth is down there somewhere. Wow, it's not often I'm mentioned in the same breath as the late, great Harry Evans, so um, thanks for that, mate. And in terms of the truth, yes, it certainly is. So we're going to dig into all those grisly crimes, and trust me, they are grisly. Jack, did you ever deal with any railway cases? Well, not really, because railways in the UK have their own police, the British Transport Police, or BTP. We occasionally asked them for information or made inquiries relating to people moving through railway premises. But to be honest, we rarely saw BTP officers at our police stations. Well, the British Transport Police Force has its roots very early in the history of British policing. The earliest record of railway police predates the formation of the Metropolitan Police, usually recognised as the first modern police force in England and Wales, by at least four years. No one knows just how many individual railway, dock and canal police forces existed in the 19th century, but they probably numbered over a hundred, largely unsung and in many cases unremembered. I suppose a modern equivalent would be private security firms in the United States safeguarding the interests and assets of corporations. These early forces combined to form the modern BTP. We looked at the recent crime figures for the BTP. There was a significant rise in all crimes of 12% in 2019. Adrian Hanstock, the Deputy Chief Constable, said the record number of passengers using the railways was behind the jump in crime rates, which were mainly theft and antisocial behaviour. Hanstock put a lot of this down to the fact that railway stations are becoming increasingly commercial environments. Well, that's certainly true. Anyone familiar with St Pancras Station in London will know that the original storage areas below platform level, they're now a stylish shopping centre and the Victorian booking office is a bar and a restaurant. The force also reported a surge in the number of vulnerable people it dealt with, including through providing mental health support. Officers and rail staff performed 2,529 life-saving interventions, up 32% on the year before. Despite this, there were only six homicides on the British railway network in 2018-19. to One was the awful death of 51-year-old Lee Pomeroy, who was stabbed to death by a paranoid schizophrenic 
after an argument on a train. Maybe there is an argument for the BTP to be amalgamated into the regional forces, to share experience and intelligence. Public transport will only increase in the years to come. Integrated management of our transport network. Imagine that. So, do criminals use the rail network as a way of getting about, or do they prefer to use the roads instead? Well, of course, they use both. But, you know, over the years, I've thought about how the world has changed. Not just in a policing sense, but how society has changed, in how it moves around. If I'm completely honest, the car has a lot to answer for. This may be just my opinion, but the car has made us selfish and antisocial. We treat the car as an extension of our private lives. Whilst it's given us choice and freedom to move around when we want to, we seem to enjoy the anonymity that the car brings us. And as policing has taught me, the public don't like it when they're challenged, do they? No, I suppose not. We all resent being stopped by the police or getting a fixed penalty notice through the post. I know I do. How dare they take a photo of me driving through that red traffic light? Not that I make a habit of it, incidentally. I suppose the car has also allowed criminals to operate in even wider areas and, as you say, Jack, being less conspicuous. You're spot on. Burglars are the best example. Dwelling house burglars usually have a rule of not shitting on their own doorstep. They prefer to steal from neighbouring estates or areas they were passing through. They always had a problem though, how to transport their ill-gotten gains. Now jewellery and cash is not a problem. Electrical goods, not so easy. The car changed all that. Not only does the car provide transport and storage, they don't stand out or look out of place, do they? It's just another car driving on a public road. Privacy, no interaction with the public. Yeah, I get it. I'm trying to imagine myself as a burglar and having to use public transport while carrying the contents of somebody else's house with me. I've got a heavy hold all bulging with jewellery and ornaments, candlesticks, that sort of thing, a Sony PlayStation, and I'm having to plan my getaway. So, 10 minute walk to the station, buy a ticket, wait around a bit. I'm restricted by the timetable. Several people might see me, look at me, heavens even speak to me. That's it, and the car changed all that. Within a couple of hours, at any time of day, a criminal could drive to another town, commit a crime, drive to a different town, dispose of the goods, then return home. The risks of being stopped by the police? You'd take your chance. Even if the police showed an interest in you, you could hide any evidence. In the worst case scenario, you could fail to stop for them and try and get away. Yeah, I see what you mean there. The car allows people to move around unnoticed at a time to suit them, protected by a metal shell. Things were very different 140 years ago. Oh, I do like to be beside the seaside. I do like to be beside the sea. It is 1881. The telephone has not long been invented. Matthew Webb has recently swum the English Channel, and unwittingly, his image has made it onto millions of matchboxes. The First Boer War has just ended in South Africa, where the British got their butts kicked. Two years ago, 75 people died in the Tay Bridge railway disaster in Scotland. This case is much further south, almost as far south as you can get on the British mainland, in Brighton, on the south coast of England. The London and Brighton Railway opened in 1841 and it brought Brighton within the reach of day trippers from London. The population grew from around 7,000 in 1801 to more than 120,000 by 1901. In 1881 there was overcrowding and disease. Clean water and sanitation were desperately needed. Just 47 miles from London the train was popular. The regular service to the capital went to Croydon and then split into two. One line to London Victoria and the other to London Bridge. Stations on the route from London included East Croydon, Three Bridges, Haywards Heath, 
Wivels Field, Burgess Hill, Hassocks and Preston Park. It's Monday the 27th of June at 2pm. Preston Park is a small quiet station serving a village on the outskirts of Brighton. The ticket collector watches the arrival of the train from London Bridge. A male passenger gets off. There's something about him that draws the ticket collector's attention. The man emerges from the first class compartment and steps onto the platform. He seems unsteady on his feet. He's not wearing a hat, which is unusual, nor is he wearing a collar and tie. Even more concerning, he's covered in blood. He seems distressed. The collector goes to his assistance. The man mumbles something about having been attacked as the train entered Merstham Tunnel. Now, Merstham Tunnel is just south of Croydon and several stops from Preston Park, probably a 30 minute journey away. The tunnel goes through a chalk hill and is over a mile long, so the train would be in darkness for what? About a minute, I suppose. Correct. Now this distressed and bloodstained man claimed that two men travelling in the same compartment struck him on the head. He remembered nothing more until the train reached Preston Park, where he came round. Now, these compartments in Victorian trains were nothing like modern trains. Let's set the scene. The compartments have two bench seats that face each other, seating up to eight people, four on each side, bumping knees kind of thing. I'm picturing them upheld with plush blue velvet cushions, carpeted floor, luggage nets above the seats, varnished wooden paddling on the doors and brass handles that say lift to open. The compartments open onto the platform but also into a corridor where staff and passengers can move along the train. I think they also had a privacy option too, at least pull down blinds to stop people looking in. Of course, popular with courting couples. The other thing importantly was the alarm. This consisted of a chain that ran along the length of the train in a metal pipe. At each compartment, the chain was exposed. Pull the chain and ring the alarm to stop the train, in capital letters. Which, of course, no one had done on this particular journey. Plus, the ticket collector saw no one else alight from the carriage. He did, though, see a watch chain hanging from one of the man's boots. He pointed this out, and the man remarked, that he'd put his pocket watch in there for safety. Due to the man's condition and his claim of being assaulted, the station master arranged for him to be taken to the police station in the nearby town hall. The man gave his name as Percy Mapleton Lefroy. What then happened was a rather shambolic and blundering investigation by the railway officials and the borough and railway police. So poor was their handling of it that it became the subject of an editorial column in the Times newspaper. The first officer involved suspected that Lefroy had attempted suicide, a criminal offence in those days. However, Lefroy continued to claim he had been attacked. After an initial interview at the police station, he was taken to the county hospital for his injuries to be treated. The doctor wanted to admit him, but Lefroy insisted on being discharged, stating he had an important engagement in London. Officers took him back to the police station. They allowed him to purchase a new collar and tie on the way. He was spoken to again. This time Mr Lefroy even offered a reward for the capture of his attackers. While at Brighton Station, he was taken into an office and searched, or at least his possessions were recorded. He had two coins in his possession, of which he denied all knowledge. Hmm, so having only just arrived in Brighton, he's keen to return to London, and it's difficult to understand why someone should attack him and leave some money in his pockets, money that wasn't his. Meanwhile, the carriage where Lefroy claimed to have been assaulted was shunted into a siding so that it could be examined. You would have hoped that someone would have already taken at least a cursory look around the compartment. Three bullet holes were found and there was blood everywhere. On the floorboards, the mat, the door handle, on a handkerchief and a newspaper left in the compartment. 
there had certainly been violence in there. There were some more coins too, similar to those found on Lefroy. So, Jack, what are your thoughts? How would a 21st century investigator approach this situation? Okay, well there's some detail missing, isn't there? However, we can assume that the officers have spoken to Lefroy over a few hours and they are still not happy with his account. The crime scene though is key. Whoever was supervising this incident must have been aware of bullet holes and blood everywhere. The blood, the involvement of a firearm that's not been located, and the coins. It must have been immediately clear that the most likely offence here was robbery. The question remained, was Lefroy the victim or the perpetrator? Either way, he should have been arrested. In cases like this, where it's unclear whether you have a victim or a perpetrator of a crime, we used to call it taking a hostage. Lock them up until the story is a lot clearer. It's not as easy these days to convince a custody officer to authorise such a detention. But in 1881, I doubt there was much scrutiny. Well, despite the inconsistencies in Lefroy's story and the suspicious circumstances, neither the Brighton police nor the railway police considered it necessary to arrest him. Instead, they decided to let him return to London. They did, however, arrange for a Scotland Yard detective named George Holmes to travel with him. But Detective Sergeant Holmes did not live up to the reputation of Sherlock Holmes, Conan Doyle's fictional sleuth. Detective Sergeant Holmes didn't shower himself in glory at all. So much so that after the widespread criticism of him, Scotland Yard disowned him publicly, stating he had left the Metropolitan Police and was working for the railway. It's always easy to be wise after the event. Perhaps poor Holmes was not on his A-game but in my opinion, neither was the officer who authorised this. Let's hear more. While Lefroy and Holmes were travelling back to London, a search of the line was being conducted, presumably for evidence or a person. And we presume that staff at the other stations on the route had been spoken to, to confirm that no suspicious individuals had got off the train before Preston Park. The search of the line would take some organising, wouldn't it? Well. Part of the line was another tunnel, closer to London than Merstham, where Lefroy claimed the attack had taken place. The Balcombe Tunnel was also about a mile long. In the darkness of the tunnel, at the side of the track, they found a body. It was an elderly man. He had been shot and stabbed. A blood-stained knife lay nearby. The man was Isaac Gold, a retired corn merchant who was now operating as, wait for it, a coin dealer. He'd been travelling from London to his home in Brighton using the first class smoking compartment. A check of his body also revealed a section of watch chain but no pocket watch or coins of which he'd been carrying a considerable amount. Now for an amazing twist. The body was discovered in time for a telegraph to be sent to the next station up the line. The station master at Three Bridges met the train and told Detective Holmes that a murder victim had been found. You would have thought that Percy Lefroy would have been arrested immediately, but no. DS Holmes was given one instruction, not to let Lefroy out of his sight. Incredible indeed. Someone in Brighton was calling the shots and Sherlock Holmes was just following orders. It also seemed that he was more interested in getting back to the Nick in London and filling out his overtime form. And lucky Lefroy can't believe his good fortune. He followed his instinct and bluffed his way out of the situation. He was on a roll. He even convinced his minder to accompany him to an address in Wallington, Surrey, so that he could get a change of clothing. They arrived at the house at 9.30 p.m. Despite being told not to let Lefroy out of his sight, D.S. Holmes was happy to wait outside, probably to enjoy a cigarette in the quiet summer's evening. Well, by the time he'd taken the first draw on his player's navy cut, Lefroy was straight out the back door and gone. Have you ever lost a prisoner, Jack? Yes, once. It's not a pleasant experience. Are you willing to tell me about it? Only that it was early in my service and it was a split-second thing. Plus, he ran off in his bare feet. Plus, we knew exactly who he was. And plus, he hadn't committed a murder. Is that what you told the sergeant? Did you get him back into custody quickly? 
Uh, yes, he surrendered the following day after a call to his solicitor. That's your story and you're sticking to it. I am. The inquest into Mr Gold's death was opened on the 29th of June and lasted several days. Holmes and the other officers had a bad time in the witness box and a verdict of willful murder against Lefroy was returned. The railway company then offered a substantial reward for information leading to his arrest. The public would take a great interest in the hue and cry for the Brighton Line murderer. The mysterious Mr Lefroy was big news, and no, they didn't have an address where they could find him. For seven hours, he'd fed the police a pack of lies and then, poof, disappeared. He even made the national papers. The Daily Telegraph made history on the 4th of July by publishing a wanted poster for a murder suspect for the first time. The artist's impression shows a sketched portrait of a man who's, well, chinless wonder really, wearing a bowler hat, presumably one that the officers had helped him purchase, bearing in mind he didn't have one in Brighton. The image is a strange looking thing, a guy with a rather weaselly face. Unsurprisingly, men answering this description were seen all over the country. The police had to follow up on these sightings. One man, presumably a look-alike, was even arrested but later released. On the 8th of July, Lefroy was found in a house at 32 Smith Street, Stepney, East London. He was lodging there under the name of Park. He'd kept the blinds down in his room all day and only went out at night. It must have come as some relief for the detectives that he'd also kept his bloodstained clothing, which was found in his room. Not only that, local businesses were able to describe him exchanging some more of those counterfeit coins and also pawning a revolver. The evidence against him was stacking up. So what do we know about him? Well, he was a journalist by profession and by some accounts, a plausible type. Now, why doesn't that surprise me? What exactly do you mean, Jack? I don't know. You seem to relish in the mistakes of my police officer colleagues. I guess we're all fallible, aren't we? True. Mm. Well, his real name was not Lefroy, not Park, the name he was lodging under, but Mapleton. He was described as unusually arrogant on arrest, telling the arresting officer... I am not obliged to say anything and I think it better not to make any answer. The arresting officer wrote this down in his notebook and read it over to Lefroy, who added, I will qualify that by saying I am not guilty. Lefroy appeared at Cookfield Police Court and was tried at Maidstone Assizes. The jury took ten minutes to find him guilty. Evidence was given by several railway witnesses, including DS Holmes, the booking clerk who issued a ticket to Lefroy, the guard of the train, the ticket collector at Preston Park, and also by a woman living at Hawley, who saw two men struggling violently in a train as it passed her cottage. So this wasn't exactly Agatha Christie, was it? The next stop after Hawley is Balcombe, and the tunnel where poor old Mr Gold came to such an undignified end. Lefroy had probably been chatting to Mr Gold and seized his opportunity to rob him. He probably would have then stepped off the train at Balcombe and calmly returned to London. However, Mr Gold put up a fight and it got messy. The Balcombe tunnel gave Lefroy a convenient opportunity to open the door of the carriage and say goodbye to his travelling companion. I guess Lefroy stayed on the train to clear his head and work out his story. Well, Lefroy's personal story was completed for him by the judge at Maidstone, who sentenced him to hang. He went to the gallows at Lewis in Sussex on the 29th of November, 1881, five months after the crime. At the time of the murder, he was indeed short of money and had gone to London Bridge, intending to rob a passenger. He hoped to find a woman or someone who would be easy to subdue. He didn't expect the courageous old gentleman to resist. Lefroy robbed Mr Gold of his watch, coin dealer's purse and wallet. And going back to your comment earlier about the police taking a hostage until they can sort things out, it was Mr Gold's watch that was hidden 
in Lefroy's shoe for safekeeping, wasn't it? The police also recovered the coin dealer's purse and the wallet from behind pipes in the washroom of Brighton Police Station. He'd managed to hide them while actually under investigation. And the weapons? Well, the knife, that was found in the tunnel near to Mr Gold's body. It's not clear what happened to the gun used that day. I guess it was thrown from the train and never found. The revolver pawned back in London. Surely that wasn't the murder weapon, was it? Nothing would surprise me with this case. But you're right, though. If he'd been taken hostage, he would never have been able to dispose of those items. Lefroy was a strange individual. He was also incredibly vain. He wore a full evening suit in court because he thought it would impress the jury. He was even allowed to take his silk hat into court. He was more interested in the hat than the proceedings, fiddling with it throughout the trial. The public, however, were more interested in the failings of the investigation. The railway police were subjected to a great deal of ridicule. Fortunately, it was another 19 years before the next murder on the Brighton line, but when it came, another followed in quick succession. go back to those most recent crime statistics for homicides on the railways. There were six in the whole of the UK in 2018-19. Murders on the railway are rare. Our research though found another case where some of the locations will sound familiar to you. There were clearly some unpleasant individuals that used the Brighton line in the old days. Louisa Massett was certainly one to fit that category. For her crime, she was hanged at Newgate Prison on January the 9th, 1900. This made her the first person executed in Britain in the 20th century. Massett was born in France to a French father and an English mother. She had an illegitimate child and, as a result, moved to England after becoming something of a pariah in her hometown. She wasn't exactly the motherly type, though. Louisa soon placed Manfred, her three-year-old, in foster care with a Mrs. Helen Gentle. Fair enough, if she needed help, but she also took on a 19-year-old lover. Hearing about her exploits and neglectful parenting, the boy's father sent word that he should live with him in France. On October the 27th, 1899, Louisa was expected to take Manfred to France and deliver her son to his father. Surely this arrangement would have suited her, but the timing of it inconvenienced her. She'd also planned a romantic getaway that weekend to Brighton, our favourite railway destination. Things seemed all set. Louisa picked up Manfred from his foster home and she took him to London Bridge Station. After waiting a short while, she took Manfred to get something to eat. Three hours later, Louisa returned alone and boarded the train to Brighton. Soon afterwards, staff checked the women's lavatory at Dalston Junction Station, where they found the lifeless and battered body of little Manfred Massett. Suspicion immediately fell on Louisa. When she was traced and interviewed, she claimed she had handed her son over to a Mrs Browning who ran a children's home. However, she also wrote a conflicting letter to Mrs Gentle saying that she was taking Manfred to France. Nobody bought her story and there was enough physical evidence to convict Louisa Massett of murder. A tragic story involving the death of an innocent child. It's easy to condemn the mother. She'd outwardly appeared to resent her child and the responsibility that he placed on her. Maybe her emotional state meant that she was not ready to return to France, where she was regarded as an unfit mother and lacking in morals. This was 1900, and at that time, Louisa Massett was highly unlikely to get any sympathy or understanding of her mental and emotional state. And since she was hanged, all opportunity for psychoanalysis was lost. She'd have been an interesting subject for Henry H. Goddard, the American forensic psychologist. Somebody like Goddard could have shared what he learned with society generally and added to a growing body of knowledge about why otherwise peaceable people resort 
to murder. The final case in our Brighton Line trilogy is even more taxing than the others, not least because it was never solved. This case is known as the Merstham Tunnel Mystery. It is Sunday, the 24th of September 1905, five years after Louisa Massett went to the gallows for the murder of young Manfred. At 10.55pm, Inspector Peacock was walking through Merstham Tunnel. This was a routine check. As he stepped along the side of the track with his lantern held out in front of him, he saw something out of place. It was the body of a woman. The body was horribly mutilated. Peacock reported the matter immediately to the Merstham station master and the local police attended. There wasn't a lot to go on. There were no letters or papers of any kind on the body to assist identification, and more significantly, there was no money or a railway ticket. No report was received of any doors being found open on trains as they passed through the tunnel, and in the early stages of the inquiry, there was no indication that any untoward incident had occurred on a train. The first theory was that the woman had walked into the tunnel to commit suicide. A preliminary medical examination, however, revealed that a scarf had been thrust down the woman's throat and this, coupled with the fact that certain marks were found on the wall of the tunnel, gave the case a sinister dimension. A description of the dead woman was circulated and on Monday, a young man named Robert Money identified the body as that of his sister, Mary Money. So, how did Mary Money die? Well, a Home Office expert expressed the opinion that the woman had been dead approximately one hour when found and that the bruises and other injuries must have been caused before death, probably as a result of a violent struggle. He also stated that there had been no sexual assault. It was considered that the 9.33pm train from London Bridge was the most likely involved as it was scheduled to pass through the tunnel at the crucial period. The train guard, though, couldn't recall certain vital points until some days after he was interviewed. He recalled that at East Croydon he'd noticed a young man with a young woman answering Money's description in a first-class compartment. At South Croydon he'd seen them again, sitting close together. Beyond the tunnel at Redhill he saw the man alight from what he believed to be the same compartment and walk towards the exit. Further information came from a signalman at Purley Oaks. He reported that when the 933 train passed his signal box, he saw a man and woman struggling in the first class carriage. He wasn't concerned by this, as he was accustomed to passengers wrestling amorously in first class carriages, and he didn't attach much importance to it. So the police had a suspicious death and they needed to find Mary Money's killer. The police thought that it was merely a question of checking up on her male acquaintances and bingo, the case would be solved. But Mary did not appear to have any boyfriends. She worked for a dairyman named Bridger and lived in Lavender Hill, Clapham. On the day of her death, she'd been at work. According to a fellow employee, Emma Hone, Mary had announced at 7 p.m. that she was, quote, going for a little walk and wouldn't be long. So, what were her movements that evening, between going for a walk at seven and when her body is found in the tunnel four hours later? Well, a Miss Golding, who ran a sweet shop at Clapham Junction, told detectives that shortly after 7pm, Mary, who was a regular customer, had bought some chocolate and mentioned that she was going to Victoria Station. A ticket collector at Clapham identified money from a photograph and confirmed he'd seen her at 7.20pm when she told him she was going to Victoria. From that moment there was nobody who could say positively that they saw Mary Money until she was found in the tunnel. The interesting thing about Mary Money was that either she was not in any relationship or that she kept things very discreet. 
The woman who lived with Mary Money and knew her very well did not know of any male acquaintances. An inquest was opened and then adjourned. There was a request that a young railway clerk be asked to account for his movements on the day of the murder. He'd known Money for years and had apparently walked out with her. He proved he was miles away at the vital time and so was cleared of all suspicion. When the inquest resumed, Money's employers gave evidence to refute suggestions that any of them had a sexual relationship with her. Superintendent Warren of the London and South Western Railway Police gave evidence. He'd arranged for various experiments to be conducted in the tunnel with the actual carriages that were on the 9.33pm train on the night of the murder. He concluded that Mary Money met her death by severe injuries brought about by a train, but the evidence was insufficient to show whether she fell or was thrown from it. There seems little doubt that Mary unknown to her family, with the possible exception of her brother, which we'll come on to, had a male friend who she met on that fateful Sunday night. Perhaps she met him at Victoria or at some other station. They must have eaten somewhere, as the autopsy showed she'd had a meal about three hours before her death. It's plausible that her male friend suggested they take a train ride together, using the first-class carriage. It seems clear that first-class carriages on quiet evening trains were a popular way for couples to get some privacy. What if she didn't want sex? What if the mystery man assaulted her? What if stuffing the scarf into her mouth was a precursor to raping her? It seems that she kept her relationships very private and that this meant the man responsible for her death was never traced. Yeah, that's true, Jack. Although Mary Money had her purse with her at Clapham, it was never found. Was it taken to give the impression that robbery was the motive? Or was robbery the motive after all? Was the murder a regular acquaintance? Or was it what you might call a first date? And the man seen by the train guard leaving the train at Red Hill, he was described as thin, with a moustache, and wearing a bowler hat. We've heard that description before, haven't we? It's about as general as a grainy CCTV image from a camera 50 metres away. Unsurprisingly, he was never traced. Maybe we should talk about Mary's brother, Robert Money. Yeah, and I often look at these historic cases and think about contemporary personalities and lifestyles. In those days, somebody's character was determined by the evidence of so-called character witnesses who were, as you can imagine, more or less subjective. In today's society, our lifestyle and our attitudes are recorded in the emails, photos, messages that we leave on our phones and laptops. There's generally a mountain of evidence of a person's lifestyle. An added twist to the Mary Money case was the character of Robert Money. Remember, he was the man who came forward to report her missing and to identify her body. As siblings, they seem to have been close and they lived in the same area. He may have known more about her than was revealed. The Moneys were a large family. Robert and another brother were in business together. Robert appeared to be involved in the dairy trade and remember that Mary worked in a dairy too. Robert Money though was an unscrupulous liar and a fraud. His own life ended in tragedy seven years later. He'd married two sisters from the same middle-class family, having convinced the whole family that he was an officer in the army, using the name Robert Murray. He divided his time between the two women, but like all complicated and deceitful relationships, it started to go wrong financially for him. On the 19th of August 1912, in a burning house at Eastbourne on the south coast of England, were found the bodies of a man, his wife and three children all of whom had been murdered. Another woman, the mother of two of the three children, had received two bullet wounds in the neck, but survived. Robert Murray had rented the property in Eastbourne for a holiday and invited his two wives and children to join him, intending to kill them and then kill himself. But this doesn't mean that he was involved in his sister's death, does it? Although having committed multiple murders in 1912, he was now in the frame for Mary's death. Mary would have trusted him. They ate a family dinner together that Sunday evening. Maybe she had something on her brother. Maybe he wanted to discuss it in private. And you don't get much more private than a first class compartment on the Brighton line on a Sunday evening. No, it doesn't. And we are speculating. 
there's another twist to the tale. Following Robert Murray's death and his real identity of Robert Money becoming known, the detectives from both areas got together and considered the possibility of other crimes. It was only then that the detectives in the Mary Money case revealed something that the coroner hadn't covered at the inquest. Interesting. Mary Money had a gambling problem and she'd been stealing money from her employers. Was there any evidence for that? Yes, there was, apparently. Her gambling was common knowledge and takings were down at the dairy where she worked. Meaning that she could have been depressed due to her gambling and the stress of stealing from her employer? Correct. Or whether she was in cahoots with her brother Robert and they fell out over it? Either way, the coroner left out the gambling evidence. <sighs> so, did Mary Money jump from the train? Or was she pushed? Well, we've still got the indication she had some material stuff down her throat and that she fell backwards from the train. I guess the coroner was leaning towards foul play, but he didn't want to taint a lady's reputation. Hmm. This doesn't get easier, does it? No, it doesn't. And it's baffled crime historians ever since. That Brighton line has a lot to answer for. It certainly does. We've got Percy Mapleton, the jumped-up journalist <clears throat> turned armed robber. Who should have been arrested at the time, rather than a bungled six o'clock knock weeks later. We've got Louisa Massett, or Massey, a young French woman probably suffering from postnatal depression and other issues due to the way the cards had been dealt for her, probably desperate for love and affection, a young woman who kills her child in absolute desperation. And who was hanged for the crime. Then the baffling case of Mary Money, a young woman who kept herself to herself and was killed for rejecting a man's advances. Or a dishonest gambler and thief who came from a family of cheats and ne'er-do-wells. And these were only three of the grisly murders linked to Brighton. In separate incidents in 1934, the bodies of two women were found in trunks. The first, discovered by an unlucky attendant in the left luggage office of Brighton Railway Station, had been dismembered and she has never, ever been identified. In the second case, the body of Violet Kay was found stuffed into a trunk at her boyfriend's lodgings near the station. The boyfriend, a waiter called Tony Mancini, was tried and acquitted of murder. It sounds like these trunk murders deserve our attention too. I'll second that. We should pay Brighton a visit when we're allowed to again. We could get some fish and chips on the seafront. And I'll show you Lover's Walk in Preston Park. It's where, in 1831, John Holloway buried his murdered wife Celia after wheeling her body there in a trunk. That's what happens when we start lifting the floorboards or digging up the flower beds. You never know what you're going to find. And that's the beauty of the six o'clock knock. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember, crimes on the railways are rarely this horrendous. Although plenty of us would call the price of a season ticket daylight robbery. We hope we've piqued your interest in true crime stories. If there's a case you'd like us to investigate, why not tweet us? We're at six knock or send us a message on Facebook. If you'd like to contribute to our work, please do check out our Patreon account. Your donations keep us in shoe leather. And when you've got size 13 feet like the governor here, new souls don't come cheap, do they, Jack? Just saying. And with that final rattle of the collecting tin, it's goodbye from us until we meet again very soon for another six o'clock knock. Six O'Clock Knock is presented by Simon Ford and Jack Morell and produced by Paul Bradshaw and is available on every major listening app. Please help us spread the word by giving us a five-star review and telling your friends to subscribe. (laughs) 